Well, good morning and welcome to Bali. It's Palm Sunday and let's join together now for our act of worship. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. Well, let's begin our worship today with a hymn. Page of the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a coat with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a coat, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the coat and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? 
The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And here ends our reading. Well, today is Palm Sunday. And this is a day which for me as a child caught my imagination more than any other day in the Christian year. I don't know whether it was the uh, excitement of the crowds as they're talked about in the story or, or whether it was the, the waving of the palm branches or whether it was Jesus riding on the back of a donkey. But there was something in this story that really caught my imagination and it stayed with me ever since. Indeed, as a, as a minister, one of the things I've never done, although I often thought I'd like to do it, is restage Palm Sunday in a service in church and bring a donkey in to take part in the procession around the church. I know some churches do that, and I'd like to do it maybe, maybe next year, um, although maybe not everyone would approve of a donkey coming into church. But it, it's certainly a very, a very vivid uh, image this this triumphal procession of Jesus and his supporters into Jerusalem and uh, we can we can see them in our mind's eye cutting down branches and waving them and throwing them in the street and throwing down their cloaks in the road uh, before Jesus as he comes into Jerusalem it's a, it's a very exciting and enthusiastic moment of appreciation really and this story came to mind uh, the other week when uh, first Thursday evening at eight o'clock when everyone went out to the front of their houses to uh, mark or show their appreciation of the health workers uh, I heard the noise and we all went out to the front and we joined in with the applause and the cheering as we we thanked all those who are working on the front line in the health service, uh, on whose care and attention we all depend. And of course there was no procession, there was the odd car going up and down, uh, many of which beeped as they went past. But it was uh, a moment when everybody wanted to um, express their appreciation. And it's something we have to acknowledge, uh, the bravery and commitment of those who are on the front line in the health service and indeed of all those who are continuing to work in essential services at the present time. But the triumphal entry into Jerusalem was a remarkable procession. It was uh, triumphal but not in terms of the world knew. In many ways it was quite revolutionary, it was a joyful symbol of solidarity with the people of God, with those in need, with the downtrodden, with the vulnerable. Now Jerusalem as a city was not unfamiliar with triumphal processions. Uh, these are well attested to in history both before the time of Jesus and indeed after and often these were conquering armies marching in to take possession of the city. And they're, they're recorded in the Old Testament in other literature and by Josephus, the, the Roman Jewish historian. Uh, now Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was in accordance with Old Testament prophecy and there are lots of echoes of the Old Testament in the story as it's told in the New Testament. But at the time, the people in Jerusalem would have been very familiar with triumphal entries into the city. Indeed, they would have seen it every year because the Roman governor, and we know that at this time the governor, of course, was Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor lived in, he had his base in Caesarea. But every year when it came to the time of the Passover, uh, the governor would bring his troops and his retinue and decamp into Jerusalem. It was a very volatile time, the Passover, and the population of the city would swell with thousands of pilgrims. So the Romans liked to make sure, in a very unsubtle way, that everyone knew who was in charge, and so they would process from Caesarea into Jerusalem 
of this time of year. And it's not hard to imagine this picture, this procession, with the, uh, the, the governor, the representative of the Roman emperor at the front of the procession on his white horse. Now, as far as the Romans were concerned, their emperor was a god and the governor was the representative of the emperor. And they had, they had some respect for the Jewish religion, uh, but they also regarded it with, with a degree of distaste because they looked down their noses at it. They had their own religion and uh, they thought that the, the Jewish religion was a little bit barbaric. But the main thing they wanted to show uh, was that they were in charge. And the main thing they wanted from the Jewish population was order and conformity. And of course for them to pay their taxes. But contrast this with Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Uh, as a king, but not as a king as the world knew it. Uh, not someone uh, who conquered and oppressed but rather someone who brought hope and liberation for all people. Now, according to some theologians, the entry into Jerusalem by Jesus on Palm Sunday was the same day that the uh, Roman governor returned to Jerusalem. So we have this contrast between the representative of the emperor, the uh, figure of Pontius Pilate, probably on a white charger at the head of hundreds of Roman legionaries and possibly at the same time, according to some theologians, on the same day Jesus' entry on the other side of the city, coming into the city as a king but not a king as the world knew it. So two very clear opposing tendencies, one representing wealth power and authority, the representative of the emperor with a massive army, the other representing a humble expression of the value of the individual human life in the eyes of God. It's such a clear contrast with the power of the Roman Empire. Uh, the source of its power was seen by all who stood by the western gate of Jerusalem as the military procession marched in. And Jesus' mission was to show people that the source of power for the kingdom of God was wholly different. It was a power that came not through arming yourself, but through humbling yourself, through foot washing, through serving, through acknowledging the presence of God in the heart of every being. And this was displayed very clearly through his own procession on the other side of town, on the back of a humble donkey. There could be no clearer contrast. This was the message that Jesus communicated to the watching crowds. And he was pointing to a new era, the establishment of the kingdom of God here on earth. And this is the vision of the new world which Jesus brings. And he holds out an invitation to us all to join in the building of this kingdom. And at the present time, all those who are dedicating their time and their effort to healing the sick and keeping our society running, all those working in the health service, all those manning all the essential services that we need, they are giving their part to the building of the Kingdom of God. Because it's a kingdom based on service and respect for all of humanity before God. And we thank all those people for their service. Amen. Well, let's join together now in the fellowship of prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we pray for the world and our place in it. As we remember the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, so we commit ourselves to the vision of your kingdom, a kingdom based on love and compassion, on justice and peace. As we pray, we bring before you our families, 
our friends, our loved ones, our communities, and all those in need of support and your healing. We call to mind especially all those people who are in hospital, or undergoing treatment, or awaiting results. And we ask for your love and your healing to unfold them. We pray for those diagnosed with COVID-19 and for those working to supply a cure. We pray for all those facing new and unexpected health challenges and ask that they may know your presence now. We give thanks too for all those working in the health service. We ask for your blessing upon them that they may find the fortitude and strength to continue their work and know the support and goodwill that surrounds them. Be with us as we all seek to know your will and your direction in our lives, this day and every day. These and all our prayers we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Um.